If you have your Bibles, go ahead and turn to John chapter 1. Pastor William last week opened up um, the new series. We're going to be walking through the book of John, My probably my favorite book. Um, they're all great, uh, but, but I do enjoy John uh, very, very much, and um, Pastor William and I are going to be kind of tag-teaming through it. Um, so it's going to be, it's going to be good. I believe with the Lord's help and anointing, you're going to, you're going to get a lot out of the book of John as we walk through it verse by verse. Um, we're going to be in John chapter one, verse 14. I, um, heard a story about a grandfather who was visiting his daughter and, and his grandchild and, and he loved spending time with them and, one day he walked into the room, and he was just a little bitty, little bitty boy. And uh, he walked into the room, and he noticed that the uh, the child was in the playpen crying, and the mom wasn't in the room. And he's wondering what was going on with that, you know. And so the immediately when his grandson saw him, he lifted his hands in the air, and he says, "Out, Papa, out! Get me out!" He's crying, and course it just melted the heart of the grandfather he walks over and he picks him up and he starts to care for him and pat him on his back and and you know take care of him try to calm him down and in that moment law and order walked into the room and his daughter walked in and says dad what are you doing he's like well he was crying and he asked for me to take him out and she said yes but he just messed up and she had, you know, she was all frazzled and, and he could see the look on her face and her disposition. And, and he, had to, he had a moment to think, what do I do? Do I put the child down and, 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 you know, go with what my daughter or his mom wants? Or do I, and, and hurt my child or, do I, or my grandchild, or do I hold him and, and, and take care of him and do what my heart wants to do? And he had this moment of indecision. And he didn't know what to do, and he weighed the balance of both, and his solution was this. He put the child down. The mother smiled. Then the grandfather stepped into the playpen to sit down and play with him. And he felt like it was a win-win. I heard that story because I think that's what probably many of us would do. Try to, we, we hate seeing our kids or our grandkids. Well, I don't have grandkids, thank the Lord. But not yet anyways. Uh, uh, but but when, when our kids are crying, we, we don't like that. We, we, we don't like to see our kids hurting and crying. But the grandfather stepped into the playpen to be with the grandchild. I, I heard that story and I thought, you know, that's exactly what Jesus did for us exactly what he did for us. He stepped out of heaven and he stepped into our world, a world that was full of hurt, a world that was full of pain, a world that was full of disappointment and people letting you down, a, a, a world that's full of heartache. And he came into our world and he lived among us as he does today. It's a great picture, that story of what Jesus did for us. He climbed into this life with us. First John, uh, excuse me, John chapter one, verse 14. And I know Pastor William ended on this verse last week, but I'm gonna try to get through four verses tonight. I don't know that I am, but I'm gonna try. Pastor Larry left me a lot of time tonight, so we're gonna work on it. So the word became human. I'm reading for the New Living Translation. And made his home among us. And he was full of unfailing love and faithfulness. And we have seen his glory. The glory of the father's one and only son. John testified about him when he shouted to the crowds. This is the one uh, I was talking about when I said. Someone is coming after me who is far greater than I am. For he existed long before me. From his abundance, we have all received one gracious blessing after another. Aren't you thankful tonight for God's blessings? For the law was given through Moses, but God's unfailing love and faithfulness came through Jesus Christ. No one has ever seen God, but the unique one, who is God himself, is near the Father's heart. He has revealed 
God to us. In other words, John was saying that when you see Jesus, you see the Father's heart. When you hear Jesus, you've heard the Father's heart. The first part of verse 14 says that the word became flesh. And if I'm gonna tell you tonight anything it's, uh, that, that separates Christianity from every other religion on the planet, this is the single most unique quality of Christianity that separates, that separates it. God became flesh. He stepped into our world. He stepped into our playpen, if you will, and Jesus is the visible word of God. Theologians call this truth the incarnation, they, 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 that Jesus is the infinite second person of the wisdom of, of the Trinity who, who created all things according to John 1.1. 1, 1. He became a soft little baby. How many of you remember the day your child was born, your first child? Right, right, how soft they were before they toughened up and hardened up and rebelled against everything you wanted them to do, right? But in that first moment, they, weren't they just everything you ever wanted and desired in that moment? Not that that ever goes away, that, desi- that, that, that love for them, but you remember how soft and, and how cuddly that baby was. That's, that's the staggering thought, that the Son of God did not cease to be God when he became a man. Instead, he added manhood, but he did not subtract deity. He stayed fully God even though he was born a baby. He was fully God, fully man, without sin. He was the God-man. And the intersect he represented was humanity and divinity. And Jesus was the full expression or definition of, of, of divinity and humanity. I love how the message version uh, says the first part of John chapter 1, verse 14. It says it this way, that the word became flesh and blood and moved into our neighborhood. You ever, anybody ever read the message version? I love how it's not, it's not the one you're going to study, right? But I love how the wording is on the message version because it really kind of helps make it hit close to home. That The word became flesh and moved into our neighborhood. For 33 years, God moved into our neighborhood. The NIV version says that Jesus made his dwelling among us, which literally means to make one's tent. That in other words, he came and he made his tent and lived in his tent among us. When we, when we would, anybody ever been camping before? You ever been camping? I remember going camping as a child. I loved going camping, right? As a dad now, I hate going camping. I do it, but it's not my favorite. But I still do it on occasion when my son asked me to go. Um, but I remember as a kid, we used to go camping a lot. And, and, and the thing about when you go camping, especially if you're like in a, in a national park or something like that, there's not a whole lot of privacy when you're living in a tent, right? If there's a light in the tent, you can see people sitting up, you can see them eating, you can see them con- conversing with one another, you can hear their conversations. There's not a whole lot of privacy when you go camping. And to say that Jesus lived in a tent implies that he wants to be on familiar terms with you and me. That he wants to be a part of your life. He wants to step into your playpen. He wants to have a, a lot of interaction with you. You see, the Pharisees never saw Jesus that way. The, the, they never, the, the Messiah that they thought would come would not be a Messiah that would interact with the people and want to be with the people and interact with the Gentiles and, 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 and be a man of the people. The, they didn't see him that way. And, and if you think about it like this, there were, could you imagine instead of living in a tent that he lived in a mansion? What if Jesus had moved into our neighborhood and built the biggest house on the block? And let's say he made that house three stories tall. I mean, it just hovered and towered over everybody else. Let's say it had no windows except for maybe one on each side where he could look down on people. Let's say that, 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 he, that he built this big, huge brick wall that was 12 feet tall 
surrounded the entire property. Cameras at every, every five feet. Big gate, right, that one man couldn't do by themselves. Surrounded by Doberman pinchers all inside that yard. Rottweilers, vicious, just salivating, waiting to bite somebody. Protecting Jesus, right? And let's say he had a moat of lava that just went right around his house. You get the picture? And let's say that on that 12-foot brick wall, there were signs every four feet that said, no trespassing, do not enter, stay away. I guess my question to you would be, if this person moved into that house, built that house, and put all of that up, would the, would the, would the prevailing message be to his neighbors, hey, anytime you want, let's come over and let's, let's share some lemonade. Let's, let's talk about the current events of the day. The reality of it is, is if, if we had somebody living next door like that, the prevailing message is, stay away. You're not welcome. You're not invited. I don't want to know you, and you'll never get the chance to know me. And when it comes to God, a lot of times I feel like that's how people see God. Is this some deity that they know exists but lives far behind the planet Mars that just that just has no interest at all in humanity. But that wasn't what Jesus did. He didn't move into a mansion that was guarded and inaccessible. He, he moved into our neighborhood. He, he lived among us. He, he dwelt among us, the Bible says. He, in other words, he made himself so accessible. Anybody watching The Chosen right now? Into season four? Um, I, such a great series that really puts teeth to the gospel and to the life of Jesus. It's one thing to read it, but when you get to actually see it, he dwelt among us. He lived among us. He interacted. He, you see Jesus weeping. You see Jesus laughing. You see Jesus playing around with the other disciples. You see humanity. Grace and truth, let me back up a minute, I'm sorry. What we see here is the intersection, if you will, of grace and truth. The first one was between deity and humanity that's expressed in Jesus. The second one here is, is grace and truth that perfectly is exhibited in Jesus' life. John 1.14 again says, or it continues to say, who came to the Father full of what? Grace and truth. The Apostle John knew Jesus just about as well as anyone. And when he was groping to find the words to describe Jesus, John said, I'll tell you this, that Jesus is full of grace and truth. One translation puts it this way, that he is generous inside and out, true, uh, truth from start to finish. That was Jesus. Grace and truth are two concepts that, that don't often appear together. Because as humans, we tend to err on the side of one or the other. We're either going to err on the side of grace or we're going to err on the side of truth. If we stress grace, then we're going to be very quick to, to forgive people and to cut them slack when they do us wrong. If we judge too harshly, then we make forgiveness impossible. But the Bible says that he was full of grace and what? Truth. Let's talk about that for a moment. What does it mean to be full of grace? What does it mean to be full of grace? Jesus dealt graciously with everybody that he met, especially those who were reeling from the, an immoral life or dealing with moral sin uh, uh, or, 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 or their life was some kind of train wreck when, they, when he ran into them or when he, when he met, met them. Grace is this. Grace is overwhelming kindness, goodwill, and favor. Grace is overwhelming kindness, it's goodwill towards people, and it's favor. It's a special kind of tenderness. Parents, as you read through the Gospels, would bring their children to Jesus, and he would bless them. The leper came wanting to be healed, and the Bible says that Jesus made him clean, right? It's, it's overwhelming kindness, 
The woman caught in the act of adultery wasn't condemned, but was instead giving grace as she was told to go and sin no more. The disabled, the, the discouraged, the disenfranchised, the, the down and outers, the downtrodden, they grabbed every chance they could to be close to Jesus. Why? Because he was full of grace. Can I tell you tonight that we live in a world where people need grace? None of us are perfect. None of us are faultless. None of us are sinless. We all have, we all make mistakes, both great and small. And we're surrounded by people in our sphere of influence that do the very same thing. They, head their head, head, they hang their head in shame daily because we don't live in a world full of grace. Some of us, it's very foreign nature for us to, to grant people grace. And maybe it was because we, we didn't feel like we got it from people. But can I tell you that when you, when you observe the life of Jesus, what you see is a man full of grace with everybody that he met. A man that was always quick to give the kind word. It also says that he was full of truth. Turn to your neighbor and say, full of truth. Jesus was truth personified because he permeated perfection fully. He, knowledge and wisdom and excellence and all of those things, he was full of truth. And all that he spoke was truth. All that he did was truth. All that he thought was truth. The Bible says that he is the way, the what? The truth and the life, right? And because he is full of truth, he spoke truth to those who needed to hear it. The religious people who reacted angrily to, to Jesus giving people grace. Can you imagine that, that scene? We got to see it. You get to see it uh, lived out a little bit in, in The Chosen. But if just as you're reading through the Gospels, it's still, after all these years of reading Scripture, I'm still shocked that there were religious leaders that were angry that Jesus was being graceful with people. They were angry that Jesus was being kind to Gentiles. They were angry that, that Jesus was dishing out not just grace, but that he was, that, that he was um, dealing with people in truth. They, were, they didn't like it. They didn't like it. In fact, it says that that we read in the Gospels that his harshest words ever spoken weren't to the people that needed grace. It was to the religious leaders. Those that didn't get it. Those that didn't want people. Why do you think that the religious leaders didn't want Jesus giving out grace? Not only because they didn't think he was who he said he was, but they needed shame to keep their finger on people. Because they knew that people could not keep all of the laws of Moses. Right? They didn't want people to give grace and forgiveness because it would, it, would, it would necessitate them being able to take their thumb off people, and they didn't want to do that. Look what it said in Matthew 20. You don't have to look there, but you can listen. Matthew 23, 33, Jesus said to the Pharisees, you snakes, you brood of vipers. Can you imagine him saying this? How will you escape being condemned to hell? He delivered the truth to those who needed to hear it, to those who turned the Father's house into a den of thieves and overturned tables and benches. Listen, with Jesus, thankfully, you can always count on grace and truth. He tells the truth about your life. He tells the truth about your situation. And then his grace causes him to stick with you all the way. In other words, he approached my life and he said, Gary, I see you for who you are. I know you. And there's things in your life that I don't like. But I'm going to change you. And I'm going to give you a new life. And can I tell you something? As an 18-year-old young man that wasn't raised in church, those were words that stuck with me. First of all, I didn't think I deserved them. He tells the truth about your life. He tells the truth about your situation, and then his grace causes him to stick with you all the way. 
Jesus loves me enough to spell out my sinfulness. I love what Max Lucado says. God, he says, God loves me just the way that I am. What's that? Grace, right? He loves me just the way that I am, but he loves me too much to let me stay that way. That's truth. Through no merit of my own, he offers his incomparable kindness and forgiveness by sacrificing himself as the penalty for my rebellion. That was Jesus. He was full of grace, and he died for you and me while we were yet sinners. Because he was full of truth, he was able to pay for our sins completely. And I love that. One author puts it this way. He says, Jesus is truth. He is grace. And in his truth, Jesus tells me the story about my life and where I stand. He tells me that I am spiritually dead, booked on a one-way flight to hell, incapable of achieving heaven on my own power, incapable of lifting myself up out of despair of an empty life or releasing myself from the iron chains of habitual sin. But in his grace, Jesus loves me, seeks me, calls me, redeems me, walks me through the hours of the day and guards and stands guard over my slumbers at night. That's his grace. Every Christmas, we were reminded of the, the word that became flesh and he dwelt among us. And Jesus has this perfect ability to tell us the awful truth about ourselves while holding us up in his grace. He tells us exactly who we are. Can, we, can I tell you tonight that Jesus knows everything about you? There's no part of your life that, that is hidden from, from his sight. And yet, when you think about your life and you think about all of the wrong, and, and maybe tonight you're sitting here and you have certain parts of your heart that are closed off. There's, there's been certain things in your life that you've kept from him. Can I tell you that Jesus sees those things? And even though he knows that there's a section of your life that's still there, he still loves you. He tells you the truth about the condition of your heart, but his grace holds you up. It's the, it's the intersection between self, I mean, uh, between grace and truth. He's full of grace, and he's full of truth. The other intersection that we see in verse 14 is one between self and Savior. Look what it says there in verse 14. It says, we have seen his glory, the glory of the one and only. John, is, John here is saying, he's using the, the third person pronoun, if you will, um, we, to show that the disciples had the privilege of seeing the glory of God Exhibited in Jesus. That word seen is a rich word. It means to carefully scrutinize. It's the idea of scanning or examining or, uh, uh, or, or looking at in order to understand. Think back for a moment when, when Jesus made himself real to you. When he intersected your life. Think back to that moment for a moment. Right? Because in that moment, I think about my life when I was an 18-year-old young man like I said, not having been raised in church, I'm, I'm sitting there, and I, and I know I've shared this, but it's so vivid to me still, all these years later, I'm, I'm only like 29, so it, it wasn't that many years ago, but, but, but for the, the years that it was, I can remember being invited to youth, this girl wouldn't go out with me till I went to church with her, and I remember finally going and sitting, I remember exactly where I was sitting in that church, in, the, in that youth room that night, the very back row, the very middle chair, directly in front of the pulpit. And I remember, I don't remember the message. I, I, I can't tell you word for word what the youth pastor spoke that night. But what I do remember thinking is that this girl that invited me to church wrote down everything about my life and gave it to him right before he, he preached, right? Right? And I remember sitting in that back row being so mad that she would do that to me. Being so mad at her because it was a privilege that I came to church with her. It was a privilege. And that you take that privilege and you, and you, and you do that to me. 
come on. He preached, man, he preached. And all of a sudden, about the time that altar call hit, I mean, I was, I was, I was cross-armed. I was leaning back in that chair. I mean, if looks could just stare a hole through somebody, I don't know how he kept on preaching. He should have been distracted by my face the whole time. The scrow, you know. All of a sudden, he begins to ask those questions. I remember him asking the Holy Spirit to speak to every heart in the room. And he began to ask those questions, that question, do you know Jesus? Are you sick of how you're living? And I remember in that moment, I had a choice. And I I began thinking back on the message. And I began weighing. You know, we've all done this, right? You, when you come to Jesus, you, you, you weigh the life that you have versus the life that God wants you to have. And you have this weighing measure going on in your heart, like which way is it going to lean? Am I going to lean towards staying the way that I am? Holding on to a portion of my life or am I going to fully accept who God wants me to be and who God is into my heart and, and yield my life. And, and I was in this moment when he's asking these questions and the Holy Spirit is just like, he is just cutting me wide open in my heart. And I'm weighing the balance, right? Do I, do I stay or do I go? Do I, do I stay where I am? Because my, my life isn't bad. Until he starts talking about all of that. Then I realized all of a sudden the balance, just the scale just completely flipped over. And I thought, my God, I don't deserve any of this. And in that moment, God God did something in me. And I can't tell you what made me stand up, but I stood. And I backed myself over that chair And I walked down to the front of that youth room, that altar, and I just dropped to my knees with other teenagers that night. In that moment, I made the decision to walk with God, to yield my life to Jesus. But I had to to weigh it. I had to weigh it. And you know what? Every single one of you came to that same decision at some point in your life where you had to weigh Self versus divinity. Can we be reminded tonight that no one ever met this, that, that ever met the Savior stayed the same? You can't come face to face with Jesus and walk away different. I mean, not being different, not being changed. The real conflict here is one that is deeply personal. Some of some of you have been hit hard, pretty with some pretty bad stuff this year. Some of you are reeling. You feel like life is out of control. Or you've got so much bad news and, and, and life isn't the way that you want it to be right now. And you have been, you've been keeping Jesus at an arm's length. You're weighing it and, and you're not liking how the scales are tipping. Can I tell you tonight that he's full of grace. He's divine. He sees your heart right where you are, and he says that I will never leave you nor forsake you, that I'm with you till the end of the age, that I'm with you all the way. His grace makes him stick with you. And can I tell you, if Jesus is with you, that's all you need. Others of you know what you need to do, but you don't want to surrender yourself to Jesus all the way. You're trying to do it all yourself. And the message of Jesus is that you don't have to do life yourself. He came, he made his tent, and he dwelt among us so that you can know him and that you can live the life that he called you to live. Tragedies, I think sometimes, or maybe all the time, tragedies and loss teach us that we can't presume that tomorrow will be around. 
you've ever lost somebody, you never thought it was going to happen that quickly, especially to tragedy. Jim Cimbala, in his book about the World Trade Center, the Twin Towers coming down back in 2001, he puts it this way. He says, the only day that we really have is today. Yesterday is gone. We have no guarantee of a tomorrow, but today is the day of salvation. Today is the day, is the only day, when a person can trust Christ to be his or her Savior and Lord. That was from his book, God's Grace from Ground Zero. Today's the day. You can't wait to trust him tomorrow if you're holding back any portion of your life from him today. Today's the day to trust him. Today's the day to lean into him. Whatever you're going through tonight, you need to know that you have a savior that is full of grace and truth. He's gonna, he's gonna tell it to you straight. He's gonna, he's gonna reveal the condition of your heart. He's going to spotlight the sin in your life and mine. But then he's going to come as only he can, like nobody else in your life. He's going to remove every bit of shame. He's going to remove every bit of torment. And he's going to show you what real love really is. Can I tell you tonight, even if it's not you, there's people in our life that we work with, that we live in, a, that we share a house with, that are in our family, we share blood with. There's people that we live next to that have no idea what it means to be full of grace and truth. Can I tell you tonight that as much as Jesus did it for everybody and still does it for all of us, we can do that for others. I won't say who the person is, but I will say that my wife knows somebody, not in the church, not in our church, I promise, but that she knows somebody who is a professing believer and is always mad, always complaining, is never happy the exact opposite of what grace and truth really is. Can I tell you tonight that there's people in your life that God's gonna put in your path that need grace and truth. They need an introduction to Jesus. We can't be Jesus, full on God man, but we can be the best representative of him as we can, right? There's people in your life that need grace. There's people in your life that have wronged you. There's people in your life that need to hear truth. And we've been holding back. Stand to your feet with me if you would. I'm early. Man, I'm telling you what. I don't know if this has ever happened in 2016. How long ago was that? Eight years. But maybe it's a perfect time to spend a little extra time with Jesus tonight before you leave. I don't know what you're dealing with. I don't know what you're going through, but I know this. We need grace and we need truth in our life. And Jesus is the author of both. He's the author of both. Father, we thank you tonight for the privilege that we have to worship you, for the privilege we have to to gather in your name. And I pray that tonight, Lord God, that you would just do a good work in our hearts. Lord, if there's some of us that aren't as near as we should be, We've got walls built up around our heart because of hurt or disappointment or, or unanswered prayer, whatever the case may be. Tonight, would you, would you just shower us with your grace? Lord, those that may be here that are hanging their head in shame, they, they don't feel like they deserve any ounce of your grace or your salvation. They love you and they come and they go through the motions, but in reality, deep in their heart, they, they're struggling. They're struggling with grace. Tonight, would you, would you just allow the Holy Spirit to be the key to their heart? Open up every door, every closed room. God, and fill it with your grace and your mercy tonight. Speak truth as only you can, Holy Spirit. Speak truth to us. May we leave here changed. If, if, we, if we're holding things back, if, we're, if we are, there's parts of our previous life that we're hanging on to. If we're straddling the fence in some areas of our life, Jesus, tonight, I pray for truth and grace 
to fill hearts. Fill hearts tonight. Draw us close to you. And Lord Jesus, give us the boldness and the wisdom to share that which we receive to those that you bring across our path, those that we do life with. In Jesus' name, amen. you want, we're going to open up the altars and, and um, you can come and spend a few minutes in the altar. If you want to pray in your chairs, you can do that. If you want to pray with somebody, you can do that as well. We're up here to pray with you, but let's spend some time with the Lord. We've got about 10 minutes before the kids release. You're welcome to stay longer than that, but, uh, but let's spend some time with the Lord tonight and ask the Holy Spirit to deal with our hearts. God bless you. Draw me close.